I want to ask you to open your Bible this morning to Acts chapter 2 and look at verses 41 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. And when you found that, would you please rise and stand in the honor of the reading of the Word of God? So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and repeat this prayer after me? Lord Jesus, speak to my heart today. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. About 20 years ago, while I was pastoring First Baptist Church in Midland, I brought our staff up here on a trip to Dallas to tour some of the leading churches in the Metroplex. Uh, we went to Irving Bible Church and then over to Lake Point Church in Rockwall and then to Prestonwood, all of which have a more contemporary design to their buildings. And then we finished the day at Park City's Baptist Church over there on Northwest Highway in Dallas. We ended there because my predecessor at First Baptist Midland was Dr. Jim Dennison, and at the time he was the pastor there. And you know, if you've ever driven around that area, that as you drive up, you see this 16-story high steeple and the ornate Corinthian columns and the traditional reddish brick exterior to the buildings and the long rectangular sanctuary. And when you walk through the sanctuary, there are the traditional pews with the beautiful white ends. Well, when we left Park City's church, the comment was made by one of the staff members, now there's a church. That's how a church ought to look. As I reflected on that staff member's observation, I understood what he was trying to say. His personal preference was a traditional look to church buildings. However, ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is the buildings are not the church. The buildings may tell you a lot about a church. They may not. But the buildings are not the church. I have preached in some magnificent sanctuaries with churches that were on life support, and I preached inside a tent where a church met that was filled with life and vitality. This beautiful room in which we're gathered right now is not First Baptist Church in Allen. Rather, the people who belong to this family of faith, saved by grace, baptized as believers, united in your commitment to Christ and His mission, you are First Baptist Church in Allen. And if you really desire to see how a church is supposed to look, the place to turn is not an architectural digest of churches, nor a picture book of lovely churches and cathedrals. No, the place to turn is to the Word of God, and especially to what we just read, where we see the picture of the early church in Jerusalem immediately after Pentecost. It is the church that's been described as a church in the afterglow of Pentecost. And we saw the picture of that church when what we read a moment ago. I look at that church and I say, now there's a church. That's how a church ought to look. So I want us to take to, some time to study how this church looked. And from my, my uh, first observations, I can tell you already, I can see a lot of things uh, that are in this, a part of this fellowship of believers uh, that are compliments uh, to what we see here in this church, and I'm impressed with what I've seen. As I look at this church, it is my prayer that until Jesus comes, not of your physical facility, but rather of the body of Christ that assembles here, that the world can say and be right, the Lord would say and know He's right, now that's how a church ought to look. And I want to ask you maybe to just write the, the letter F down six times on your notes uh, because this is one of those sermons where it's okay to make straight F's, okay? Because uh, everything I'm going to share with you starts with that letter. The first quality in a good-looking church is faithfulness. Faithfulness. 
Really, the word faithfulness can be wrapped around everything about this church in Jerusalem. They were faithful to everything of which they were part as a church. But let's begin here, since this is at the heart of how a church ought to look. You'll notice in verse 42, we read, They devoted themselves. The New American Standard Version even has it, and they were continually devoting themselves. That expression is another way of stressing their faithfulness. So to what were they so faithful, so devoted? Well, let's look. For one thing, they were devoted to the Word of God. Verse 42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching or doctrine, depending on your translation. The word there is the Greek word didache, teaching. Then what were the apostles teaching? They were teaching the Word of God and the words of Jesus, the Son of God, at whose feet they had sat for three years. So the leaders of this church were faithful to teach the Word of God, and the people of this church were faithful to learn it and to apply it. And that's the first thing you ought to say, yeah, we, what we would say about how a church ought to look. People of a good-looking church are people who have their Bibles open and they're ready and eager and hungry to learn. They'll be devoted to the truth of God. They'll love their small group Bible studies and the instruction they get from the pulpit and the weekday Bible studies they can participate in. They'll love to spend time probing the Word of God on their own each day. And they'll love to enlist more and more others to participate, participate with them in the study of God's Word. In the almost 42 years that I served as a senior pastor, it wasn't unusual for someone to visit our church and when I would visit them in person or by phone in return to hear them say, you know, Gary, one of the main things that impressed me about your church is that we actually studied out of the Bible. They'd say something to the effect, I left my former church because there is no devotion to the Word of God there anymore. The Bible is ignored in Sunday school and even disputed from the pulpit. They'd say, I started attending over here because I had heard that preacher and staff and leadership and teachers at your church believe and teach and preach the Bible, and the people seem eager to learn it. Oh, may it never be any other way for any church, because that kind of spirit sure helps make a church look good. But not only were they devoted to the Word of God, they were devoted to the worship of God. Verse 42 goes on to say they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now let me point out three things at this point. For one thing, they were devoted to the ordinances in worship. For you see, the breaking of bread in verse 42 is believed by many scholars to be a reference to the Lord's Supper, which was and is a part of the corporate worship of a fellowship of believers. It's not the same activity that is described down in verse 46 as, as breaking bread together from house to house. So these folks were doing what Jesus had commanded, that's what an ordinance is referring to, a command of our Lord, what he instructed his church to do, to remember his sacrifice on the cross to pay the penalty for their sins through the breaking of the bread and the partaking of the drink. Indeed, this church participated in both ordinances. Baptism, verse 41. The Lord's Supper, verse 42. Jesus had told them to remember him this way, and from the very beginning of their, their involvement together, they were devoted to it. They were also devoted not just to the ordinances in worship, but to prayer in worship. That's how verse 42 goes on. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now the word prayer there, the Greek word prosukais, literally means the prayers. The late Southern Baptist scholar A.T. Robertson said this refers to a devotion to services where they prayed together. This is stated and public prayer. It's when a congregation comes together and prays as an assembly of God's people. And I'm talking about fervently praying rather than merely repeating rote prayers. The congregation in Jerusalem devoted themselves to such corporate prayer. When they worshiped together, public prayer was very much a part of it. And then they were also devoted not just to the ordinance of worship and to prayer and worship, but to praise in worship, as we've been involved in already this morning. Verse 47 speaks of them praising God. Now, this was spontaneous, a natural expression of their hearts for the supreme blessing they had found in Christ. And by the way, look down at the first of verse 46. It says, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. Now, that may not sound like all that much on the surface, but don't forget, the temple magistrates were the very ones who had plotted to have Jesus crucified. They were the ones who were so jealous of his following, and a little after this, preaching at Solomon's porch at the temple, would land the leaders of this same church in jail. So these were people faithful, faithful to worship the Lord, no matter the cost. 
and one cannot overlook the words every day. Talk about faithfulness, not just every Christmas and Easter. They came together and worshiped together every day. There's a popular song from some years back that says, Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fires of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we lead lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Oh, may it be so for the congregation of this church and the congregation of the church of which I'm a part because faithfulness sure does look good on a church. That brings me to the second quality of a church that you see in the church in Jerusalem. Not just faithfulness, but fear. Verse 43, the way it's put in the Christian Standard Bible that I'm reading from says, everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. I choose the word fear because the King James Version renders it and fear came upon every soul. One of the songs we sang a few moments ago alluded to this kind of fear. These people were filled with fear at the wondrous works that God was doing among them. Not fear in the, in the sense of dread or intimidation, Rather, fear in the sense of reverent awe. The verb here is in an imperfect tense, suggesting continuing action. They were filled with an an ongoing, persistent sense of awe. They were overwhelmed with a lasting sense of wonder at the wonder-working power of God. And they reflected a holy fear and humility of the perfect holiness and purity of God. They could not get over how great God is and what great things they saw God doing. Oh, listen, every church ought to look like that. There ought to be a holy fear of God, a sense of awe in His presence and awe at His power. Frankly, if the 21st century church in the Western world in particular has lost lost anything, it's a loss of that wonder of what God can and does do. One of the things I love about little children is that they've not lost their sense of wonder. Their eyes still get big at unexpected discoveries. They're still amazed at what God does in the day-to-day world. The great stories of the Bible keep them on the edge of their seats. As grown-ups, sometimes we lose that. And we lose it to our detriment. The believers in the early church hadn't lost it. They were in utter awe of God's majesty, holiness, and mighty deeds in their midst. And that, too, is a part of how a church ought to look. But let me tell you the third characteristic of this church. That's how a church ought to look. And that is encapsulated in the word fellowship. Look back at verse 42. Uh, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the next thing it says is, and to the fellowship. So if you want to know what a church is supposed to look like, you find out what fellowship looks like. And frankly, it doesn't look like cookies and punch. The word fellowship is the very familiar Greek word koinonia. The word actually uh, refers to people being in a partnership bond, a commitment to mutual concern one for the other. It represents being in communion one with the, the other, a communion of love, sympathy, encouragement, forgiveness, patience, support, understanding, and even sacrifice. And I see three distinct aspects of a caring fellowship in this passage. For one thing, in a caring fellowship, people enjoy each other's company. They enjoy each other's company. That's seen in verse 44. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. That is to say, they made a practice of getting together. A good-looking church is one in which the people just love being with each other. This church in Jerusalem was one big happy family and getting bigger all the time. Verse 46 amplifies this even more when it says they broke bread from house to house and they ate together. In contrast with what is said in verse 42, this is not a reference to the Lord's Supper. This speaks of fellowship meals in each other's homes. In fact, this is the original Baptist potluck right here. They made it a habit of going into the homes of one another and eating together. And in that culture, that was the most intimate form of fellowship one knew. And they couldn't wait till the next time they got to do it. One of the saddest traits of 21st century living 
is the way social media and addiction to devices has contributed to less and less in-person fellowship with one another. And then COVID even exacerbated that the last few years. And experts are now telling us this is having a serious detrimental impact on the emotional well-being of more and more people all the time, especially people who live alone and the only contact they have with other human beings is outside their churches, places like the grocery store. People desperately need this loving touch and contact with one another. And in a caring fellowship, the people love being together in one place where there can be eye contact, conversation, recreation, pats on the back, handshakes, and even holy hugs. And we never know sometimes how desperately someone may need that very thing. But not only in a caring fellowship do people enjoy each other's company, but in a caring fellowship, people care for those in need. Notice their extent of commitment to fellowship with one another in verse 45. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. They cared so much for one another that the ones who did own property or possessions would gladly sell some off to share the proceeds with anyone in the fellowship in need. Caring resulted in sharing. Their love showed in their giving. And this was not a forced thing. This wasn't communism. This, they didn't do this out of aggravating coercion. This was the voluntary overflow and outgrowth of the love of Christ in their hearts. In fact, I probably ought to clarify that a literal rendering of the Greek grammar would not suggest that everybody immediately sold everything he had and threw it into one big pile. That's not what this is saying. But rather, from time to time, as needs did arise, they would sell whatever necessary to make sure no one, no one was ever left in need. Folks, if a church looks like a church ought to look... look the people have learned to love to give. They're so excited about the opportunity to get in on what God is doing and to help meet the needs of others that you never have to do any arm twisting to get them to faithfully give. But there's one other element to this commitment to fellowship. Not just enjoying each other's company and caring for each other's needs, but in a caring fellowship, people are united in purpose and mission. The people of this church were all on the same page, and that page was doing what Jesus told them to do shortly before he ascended into heaven in what we know as the Great Commission. They were not competing agendas in the church in Jerusalem. They were not just united. They were united on, in a focus to reach out to those around them and draw them to Christ. And even, even though there's not a particular verse in here that I can point to other than verse 47 that tells you that, you see it all over the early chapters of the book of Acts where, where we focus in on this early church in Jerusalem. And I was so excited to hear Karen a few moments ago uh, tell me about a ministry that your church has on Sunday afternoons. You're Sam, right? That Sam leads. Uh, getting people out in the community. I mean, that pays dividends that we'll talk more about in just a few moments. So, in a caring fellowship if a church wants to look like a church ought to look the people are bonded together loving each other's company meeting each other's needs and committed to the common purpose that Christ has for his church so so far we've said that a good looking church is marked by faithfulness fear fellowship and the fourth characteristic is fun Somebody is saying, did I hear him right? <laughs> yes, you did. I believe it's biblical for a church to have fun, for it to be a blast to serve the Lord together. Too many times it's not for a lot of churches. That was a problem in Malachi's day. The people came to worship, but when they got there, Malachi 1.13 tells us they said to themselves, what a burden. Church ought to be a blessing, not a burden. It ought to be a delight, not a drudgery. It was for these early Christians. Verse 46, one translation renders it their gladness and sincerity of heart. The word glad or joyful is a word that means high delight. It means to be jubilant. They got high delight out of being together. It was fun. It was joyous. It was exciting. I mean, they couldn't wait for the next opportunity to be with each other. Something is wrong if people mumble through the music, fumble through the bulletin, stumble through the sermon, and grumble through the altar call. One of the things that thrilled me about your church was to see how animated you are in worship when I was sitting or standing here worshiping with you today. That says so much about 
uh, how your church is on the right page when it comes to this. The late Southern Baptist humorist Jerry Clower used to remind us that there's just one place that there's not any laughter, and that is hell. I think we take ourselves too seriously sometimes at church. The funniest things in the world happen while we're gathered together as a church. Part of the reason, and probably the main reason, is because there's always kids around. And you never know what kids are going to say and what they're going to do. I mentioned Jeff Brooks a minute ago. Well, when Jeff was in like first or second grade, uh, their Sunday school class uh, was assigned to draw a picture of their favorite Bible story. And Jeff drew this very sophisticated looking picture, which I, which I kept for many years. I may still have it in my files. Uh, and it was titled, The Lad Who Had. But it was five wagons. And these five wagons were loaded over with some kind of product. And so when the teacher asked Jeff, Jeff, what story is this about? He said, well, don't you know? This is about the boy who gave the five loads of bread. And the two fish. That's when I figured out how Jesus fed all those people. With five wagon loads of bread, you can pull that off. I remember one time, uh, I, one of my favorite uh, weeks of the year, every year was vacation Bible school. Uh, and I miss it because it was so fun being around the kids. They really kept me young. And every year there was one class that would bring their uh, kids uh, to, the, to my office and my study uh, so that I could talk to them, explain about my work and everything. Uh, the lady who led that class was named Billy Franklin. She's now in heaven. They brought this group in this one year, and three or four things happened almost consecutively that I'll, I've never forgotten. First of all, I, I got in the middle of them and said, now let's form a circle here. And when they formed a circle around me, there were about maybe 16, 18 kids in there. I said, well, here's what let's do. Let's just each one of you run around the circle and tell me your name. Well, the very first kid took me literally. He starts running around the circle telling me his name. <laughs> and said, so, okay, wait a minute. Let me explain myself a little more clear on that. And got that one cleared up. And I said, now, you see all these books? I've been blessed with a lot of books. And I said, do you have any questions about my books? And one little girl said, yes, where are your coloring books? <laughs> so I take them into the sanctuary, and I'm thinking, okay, we're going to be serious now. And in, uh, in the worship center of First Baptist Midland, uh, there's like these 16 foot tall marble doors that have to weigh a couple of thousand pounds and they shut and open by a motor and up above them it says death burial resurrection Romans 6 4 so I tried my best to explain to kids about to go into the first grade how baptism represents death burial and resurrection and I believe I might not have done that good a job because when I took them up to the baptistry area which we had filled with water and had gave them each a chance to look down in there one little girl said what do they do down there in that water and the little boy said, I think that's where they bury all those dead people. <laughs> Folks, those kinds of funny, cute, humorous, memorable things happen all the time at church if you're just looking for them. And that's a part of what makes it so rewarding to be a part of a church. If a church looks like it ought to church, look, people enjoy it and not just endure it. Jesus compared himself to a bridegroom and the church to a bride. That means worship ought to be more like a wedding than like a wake. Bible study ought to be more like a feast than like a funeral. Teachers should act like groomsmen and bridesmaids, not pallbearers. The world has sadness enough to it already without the church adding to it. And the way I understand it, in the afterglow of Pentecost, the fellowship of believers was filled with jubilation. Their hearts were light. Gladness prevailed because they served a risen Savior. He had washed away their sins and they knew they were bound for heaven. Now, let me show you two other things real quickly. If a church looks like a church ought to look, it'll be marked by faithfulness, fear, fellowship, fun, and fifth, favor. Verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, this quality in the Jerusalem church is often just passed over, but God saw fit to stress in His Word that they enjoyed the favor of all the people. All the people actually meaning the people as a whole. Taken as a whole, the people in the city of Jerusalem thought very highly of these early disciples. Their fervor in temple worship commended them, and their happy conduct with praise to God on their lips made the Jews truly like them. 
This church was highly respected in their community. In fact, later on, even, a, even after God struck dead Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Spirit, Acts 5.13 still says they were highly regarded by the people. I want to stress that your most valuable asset at First Baptist Church in Allen is not your property. It's your name. Proverbs 22.1 says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. How does a church get a good name? I think we all know. Simply by its members living what they say they believe. By acts of compassion and a consistent stand for right and against wrong. By not letting trivial things be dominant. By being active in your city and active with the realization that you're out there to be salt and light. By showing genuine love and compassion and attitude and action. There are churches, and I'm sure you've probably been aware of some, that actually wear their bad name in their community as some sort of badge of honor, asserting that to be respected by the world means they must have compromised their message. But the Bible is telling us here, that's not so. Though you will never be highly regarded in the eyes of all, if, if this church simply lives your uh, faith daily and loves people sincerely and worships the Lord joyously and meets needs aggressively and gets along peace peaceably, then on the whole, people who don't already have an axe to grind are going to be impressed by this church as I'm sure they already have for years. And I've found churches reach a whole lot more people when they're held in high regard than when they're held in contempt. It takes years to forge a good name. It can only take minutes to destroy it. I've known of churches that had permanently lost favor with the people of their community. It might have been a volatile pastor. It might have been controlling deacons. It might have been too many hypocritical members whose business manner or social habits didn't line up with their claim to believe in the Bible. And what they had taken years to develop, they lost. May that never happen to any church until Jesus comes. May the people of your area, the Allen area, say, I know about First Baptist Church, and I look upon that church with great favor. I like what I hear. They live their faith. They walk the walk and don't just talk the talk. When D.O. Moody was building his great Sunday school in Chicago, kids came to him from all around. They often pass by other churches and Sunday schools just to be with Mr. Moody. And when asked why he walked so far to attend Mr. Moody's Sunday school, one boy replied, because they love a fellow over there. Even kids can tell the difference. And the church they'll favor is the one known for its love. And favor sure looks good on a church. And finally, so does fruitfulness. Verse 47 Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This early church bore much fruit, not the least of which meant new converts to Christ being added to their number. And verse 47 tells us those people were being saved and added to the church daily. Now verse 47 could only be reported because of verses 42 through 46. When a church is faithful to worship in the Word and is marked by close-knit fellowship and reverent fear of God and is filled with gladness and joyfulness and earns a good name in the community, then those kinds of things prove contagious. And people will want to know what is different about that, that congregation of people. And they'll give an open ear and an open heart to hear the gospel of Christ. And the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin and their need and will convince them to follow Jesus as their Lord. And they will do that through the fellowship of that church that impressed them so much. At Jerusalem, people were being saved day by day by day. Now, quickly, let me just point out as I wrap this up, three very clear things about the kind of fruitfulness that is biblical. First, only those saved are to be added to the church. Verse 47, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. King James Version says added to the church. I'm assuming that anybody can join your Bible study groups, attend worship, attend fellowships, Wednesday evening meals, participate in your student ministry, your children's ministry, your senior adult ministry, and so forth. But a person must bear witness to having been genuinely saved and scripturally baptized as a believer and witness to that conversion like we saw so beautifully this morning in order to be added to the church membership. The ones that were the members of the church were saved and baptized. But secondly, if a person is saved, he is supposed to be linked to a local church. 
the Lord added to their number, to the church, those who were saved. The New Testament teaches that a Christian is to be a part of a local New Testament congregation of believers, a local New Testament church. There is no New Testament Christianity that is not linked to churchmanship. And third, it's the Lord that adds the new converts to the church. Verse 47 puts it, And the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. The fruitfulness is from the Lord. We can add a name to a role, but only the Spirit of God can add a soul to the role of the redeemed. That's why a good-looking church is one in which the people do not put their trust in their programs, their preaching, their plans, or their property. They put their trust in their Lord. Now, the Lord added to their number because they went out and told great numbers about the Lord. They were not content to just sing just as I am to each other. If you look over at Acts 5.42, this is what you'll read. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. They never would have seen the kind of growth they saw, saw had they not gone out faithfully and consistently to share their faith in Jesus. But combine that with the fact that the common folk out there could tell there was something unique and special about this fellowship, and the consequence was the Lord added daily to their number. That's how a church ought to look. Fruitful. And let me tell you something I've always firmly believed. God gives us some we never even went after. Just as long as we're faithful to go after some we'll never even get. Let me say that again. God will give you some you never even go after. As long as you're faithful to go after some you may never even get. God honors faithful witnessing and outreach with fruitfulness, and fruitfulness looks really good on a church. You see what I'm saying? Here is one beautiful church, and they didn't even own a building. They were adorned with faithfulness, fear, fellowship, fun, favor, and fruitfulness. Surely it ought to be the goal of any New Testament church to be so much like the early church in Jerusalem that our Lord could say of that church, now, that's how a church ought to look. And by the way, a church is made up of individual members. So the qualities that make a church look the way it should are the same for individual Christians. May I ask you some direct questions? Are you being faithful to worship and the Word? Are you living in reverent fear of the Lord? Are you living in close fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you enjoying your Christian walk or just find yourself enduring it? Do your peers look with favor on you because you walk the walk and don't just talk the talk? As a result, is fruit being born through your life and witness of people being reached for Christ? Are you helping First Baptist Church in Allen look like a church ought to look? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we rejoice in what we've experienced this morning. Thank you for the one who was gloriously and joyfully baptized and witnessed to her faith. A living reminder of fruitfulness and the way people have been used by your Holy Spirit to woo and to win and to mature and, and uh, disciple those who come to you as Savior. Father, if there's anybody in this room right now who has not made that decision, help them to know that nothing matters more. Thank you that we have a model that's so pure and beautiful in the early church in Jerusalem for the kind of ministry priorities that should never be abandoned by any church. Thank you that for many years this church has been true to these priorities. And I pray for them in this time of transition, the heartaches that they've dealt with, the heartbreak, the sorrow, I know you've been comforting them, you've been equipping them, you've been encouraging them, you've been blessing them and guiding them to their future. And we pray it'll be a future in which it is easy to say until Jesus comes. Now that's how a church ought to look. In his name we pray, amen.